Click the link in the description for your free Amsoil catalog. Before we get started, I'd like to give a quick shout out to some of our friends. The Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. Search for them on Facebook. Central Minnesota Pond Racing. Search for them on Facebook. The historic Lancaster Motel for the ultimate Eastern Trail Riding Adventure. Crane's Snowmobile Museum at 172 Main Street in Lancaster, New Hampshire. The Vintage Snowmobile Club of America Quarterly Magazine. The Bridge Street Garage Racing Team, the house racing team of the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. The New Hampshire Snowmobile Museum at Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. And lastly, if you decide to advertise with the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast, this could be your advertising message. I'm on the phone with Midge Rosebrook. How are you doing, Midge? Good, Mike. How are you? Doing well, thank you. So, Midge, tell me, what is the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? The Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame uh, is something Paul Crane and I started here in Lancaster. We uh, felt that there was a need to recognize the guys that used to race here in the East back uh, in what I would call the golden era. Uh, would be uh, from the mid-1960s to the uh, late 70s maybe early 80s, but mostly I think the meat of the golden era would be definitely the 1970s. Sure. And uh, it really, uh, racing here in the, in the eastern United States never really got covered. Those guys never really got uh, recognized like the Midwest guys did, uh, the factory drivers, you know, and the, and the big name distributors and things like that from the Midwest, they, they had this two Hall of Fames out there. Sure. And, uh, you know, they, they recognize their guys, and it's sad that uh, the Eastern guys never got recognized. And how this started was, and I can take you back to when we did the 50th reunion of the Lancaster Grand Prix in 2014. Uh -huh. The Grand Prix uh, started in in, uh, in in 1964 uh, as a side event uh, for the Winter Carnival when Lancaster was celebrating their 200th 
anniversary. And uh, it took off. Uh, and uh, thank you to Timbaland Machines, uh, the big skidoo distributor here in Lancaster. Um, it was uh, it was basically Bob Bottoms that that uh, allowed uh, his crew to help build the track. Roberts Motors stepped in. Uh, Butch and Johnny Roberts. They had a Skidoo dealership there. They helped uh, White Mountain Mac. There were several businesses in town that really stepped to forward and helped the snow drifters, the Lancaster snow drifters, uh, actually put the event on. But it uh, took it was a town effort to put this uh, big race on. And at one time, the Lancaster Grand Prix was the largest outdoor winter event in New Hampshire. Wow. They were, yeah, they, they were pulling in uh, 15,000 fans. 15,000, wow, that's a big yeah, crowd. They, uh, they, they counted 15,000 fans for a couple of years there in the early to mid-70s uh, at the Lancaster Fairgrounds. Wow, that is and, impressive. Uh, it was a half-mile oval track, mm -hmm. uh, horse track. Horse track, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, the Polaris was actually the first um, factory team to come here in 1966. Mm -hmm. Bob Eastman and Randy Heights came and raced uh, in 1966. That was absolutely that was also the first year for the Big Kilkenny Cup, which was donated by Timberland Machines to the Snowdrifters. Oh, no kidding! Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, our own Bill Buckland here from town uh, and Bobby Fortin uh, both got their names on that uh, big cup. They were the first two to to have their names engraved on the cup in 66. Nice. So, yeah, and uh, the factory teams came here uh, during the 70s. There would be 10 or 12 fully equipped tractor trailers, 45, 50-foot boxes uh, of uh, the major, you know, distributors and factory teams of the day back then. Mm -hmm. Arctic Cat came, Snowjet, Yamaha, Polaris, Skidoo, uh, Mercury, just about every big manufacturer you could think of came here to race at Lancaster. Nice. It was really, it was quite something. And uh, then it, uh, the whole thing ended in New England around 1980. Around 80, okay. Or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys that were putting it on, you know, they were, they were getting tired of uh, not getting enough volunteers to help. Uh, the insurance started getting more expensive because people were getting hurt. A couple people got killed and so the insurance started to increase. Uh, it got costly. Sure. Uh, even though the Grand Prix moved down onto the meadows, uh, it got away from the telephone poles and the, and the hazards of, of what, they, what occurred at the fairgrounds. Uh, it was a, one of the most safe, safest tracks uh, running back then. And everybody touted how great the track was. They they iced it down uh, in 1976. Uh, Gilles Villeneuve came here with that IFS rule. Oh yeah. In clean house. Nice. Yeah. This was the first uh, that he made his debut here with that IFS rule at the Lancaster Grand Prix. Oh no kidding! I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. He made his uh, made his national debut, and in the stands watching that day was Bob Eastman from Polaris he's the uh, he was the uh, team captain if you will Bob sure. Eastman yeah. and uh, his teammate Wes Pesek was there watching and this was in 1976 and they were so impressed with that that uh, Bob went back to the factory they raced at Bangor that next weekend they went back to the factory and uh, he called up a guy by the name of Gordon Rudolph, who had been himself 
dabbling with IFS slads on his own. And he, he says to Gordon, he said they hired him to come help them set up a new Polaris racer for the next season. It turned out to be that RXL. Oh, yes, yeah, so with that suspension. That front yeah, suspension. And, uh, yeah. of course, we know that, you know, that cleaned house. Sure. And, uh, but in 1977, also, it was the last year of the Grand Prix. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, 77 was the last year of the Grand Prix. And, uh, they raced in Bangor, you know, for a few years after that, and Scarborough, but basically, by 1980, 81, 82, racing dried up here in New England, and that was about it. Uh, and everybody went back to their day jobs, and and you know it it was a it was a strange thing. Uh, I I can't think of anything, Mike, in these long cold New England winters that was ever so as exciting and ever made as big an impact as did snowmobile racing back at its height. I agree, yeah. I there, agree. There was no, there's nothing, nothing since has been as exciting or as big or made as big an impact financially for these True. small towns. And there's nothing else I mean, that'll Lancaster, bring people... You know, it, there's nothing yeah. else that'll bring people, thousands and thousands of people, outside in the middle of winter to be spectators or no. something. Nothing else is no, going to no. bring that kind of a crowd. No, no, and, and, to, and to bring, uh, you know, a, a dozen factory teams from the Midwest. Yeah. You know, to, to send a, a team of five or six drivers, fully equipped tractor trailer trucks. Uh, I remember uh, Bob Clark was in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Bob Clark was uh, a multi-Grand Prix chairman uh, during that era. And uh, he said one time, he said he thought it was 1970 or 71, they they held up the races because uh, Team Arctic hadn't showed up yet. Well, well they got on to CB, huh. and they located uh, the, the Team Arctic truck. They said, where the heck are you? Yeah. And the driver says, I'm stuck. <laughs> and they said, stuck, stuck where? He said, I'm stuck here at the intersection. He said, on your main street, he said, the traffic going to the track won't let me in. <laughs> he said, the traffic is backed up as far as I can see down Lancaster's main street, and then and nobody's letting me in. Wow. So they had to, the, yeah, they had to escort. They sent a cruiser down, a state police cruiser. Yeah. And he escorted Team Arctic's big truck up the left-hand side of the road from that triangle on the, on the end of Main Street there that splits Route 2 and Route 3. Yes. And uh, he escorted him up to the fairgrounds on the left-hand side of the road because the traffic was so heavy going in. That's amazing. That's a great story. It was, it was something. Yeah. Now, while we're talking so, about uh, this, um, I wonder if you could tell me, too, that Lancaster was obviously a massive location and experience for racing, but there were... Yeah. How were they? How were they doing that? Was there a circuit around New England where they would do Bangor one weekend and Boonville another weekend? And how, how were they structuring yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that's what they did. Of course, when they came out with the USFA, uh, and uh, they sanctioned, you know, the events. Uh, Lancaster was one of the one of the big boys, and uh, we started uh, our. our uh, date was pretty much set in stone by the time USSA came out because we'd been racing here since 1962. Wow. And then, of course, they, they called it the motorized toboggan races huh. in 62 and 63. Right. And then uh, they changed it to the Grand Prix to make it sound better, I guess, for the 200th birthday of Lancaster that year. That's why they changed the name. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so... Yeah, Lancaster was on this circuit. Uh, Bangor would be, uh, I think Bangor was a weekend either before or after us, and then they did Scarborough. Mm -hmm. They did Jackman. Jackman, I think, was the, probably one of the first races 
in the east here, Jackman, Maine. I think yeah. that happened like in December or something like that. And uh, yeah, they had a race in Laconia. They had a race in Boonville, New York. And uh, yeah, the guy. It was like a circuit. It was big time. That's cool. These guys were professionals. They were pulling fifteen hundred, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars a week a weekend in. You know, to if uh, like Bobby Fortin yeah. uh, was uh, one of the big name drivers here in the East, and he, where I used to work at the golf station here in Lancaster, he always used to come in, and he'd have a check of a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars to win. Wow. Uh, plus, he'd get so much he'd get a you know a couple hundred dollars from a spark plug company or or you know dry belt company. Yeah, these guys were professionals. That's cool. And uh, it was uh, it was an exciting time. Yeah, it really sure. was. Sure. And uh, so anyway, uh, when we decided to do a 50th reunion of the Grand Prix, a lot of the old guys that used to race back then came to the reunion. And I even have a photo of a bunch of them. Lined, you, you've seen it at Paul Crane's. Yes. Those guys all lined up on the racetrack. Yeah, and uh, they wanted they they had they got me in there, and I, I kept telling them I said I didn't race. I said I should not be in there. Well, they they begged me to get they they made me go in. So yeah. I mean uh, I shouldn't have been in that photo, but I was. Yeah. Anyway, that's nice. Though. It, it really it it got me to thinking. You know, it, it's sad that these guys never got recognized. Yeah, for sure. And. Uh, so I think that I think that planted a seed. Now can you and, uh, go ahead? Yeah, I'm sorry. And I think it did. And then in 2016 we had the national show here. Yeah. And uh, it packed the fairgrounds, you know, with a bunch of whole oh, beautiful vintage slats. It just was an unbelievable show. Yeah, it was. I was there. And, it was uh, an incredible show. Wasn't it great? It, it was. was a great show. And uh, so. There again, here's Conrad Rollins, Tom Peters, uh, Bruce Bruce Dunham, Bob Martin, all came back. And, uh, you know, they they were getting into it again. So anyway, I, I said to Paul, I said, uh, the, I tell you who it was, it was a gentleman from, uh, I think it was the Hall of Fame from, uh, St. Germain, Wisconsin was there uh, selling a <coughs> raffle sled. He was selling tickets for a raffle sled mm -hmm. for for that Hall of Fame. And and uh, I had, before that, I had sent Bruce Dunham's, Bob Martin, and uh, Conrad Rollins resumes out there just to see what would happen. I, I uh, wanted to see if maybe I could get one of those guys into the Hall of Fame out there. So yeah. Paul approached the guy and he was on the board of directors as well so Paul asked him uh, what he thought what his thoughts of uh, Bruce Dunham uh, making it into the Hall of Fame that year and uh, look, he had a puzzled look on his face and he said hmm, Bruce Dunham boy he said that doesn't ring a bell he said I, I know he's not in the top ten wow and and Paul came to me and I said in in Paul says they're not in he says they don't even know who Bruce Dunham was. Wow. He said they're inducting 35 and 40 year olds out there now. He said, they're, they're, you know, there's, there's no chance. Yeah. He said, we don't, they, we'll never get them in. He said, there's not a chance. So anyway, I went back home. I didn't sleep. Actually, I think I went up to camp up to Maidstone. And I rolled and tossed and turned all night. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I sat up and sh I said right out loud, I said, and my wife wasn't even with me or nobody, I was all alone. Yeah. And I said, that's it, that's it. And I could not wait, this was Saturday, I could not wait for Sunday morning to get a hold of Paul Crane and and, and ask him, you know, if, I, I so anyway, about 7 o'clock uh, Sunday morning, uh, I didn't want to get him too early, so I waited until 7. <laughs> so I grabbed the phone, I dialed Paul's number, 
Paul answered, and I says, Paul, you're sitting down, and he says, no, he said, I, I could. <laughs> I said, what, what are your thoughts on having our own Hall of Fame? I said, we could do it at your museum. Paul says, let's do it. Nice. Just like that. Wow. And that's how it started. And the ball has just continued and, to roll yeah. from there. And it's, it's continued to roll from there. We inducted our first uh, inaugural four people uh, into the Hall of Fame uh, in 2017. Uh, it was May 19th, I think, of 2017. Uh, we inducted our first four. And, uh, and then the next year we inducted five. And then the next year we inducted five more, and in this last year we inducted seven. Nice. Now, can you tell me about some of these people who have been inducted, and also what qualifies someone to be inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? You know what? Uh, you, you you don't have to have a perfect record. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think uh, you know the, when when you say the Hall of Fame, the word fame means famous. Okay. That that's that's just a short for famous. Mm -hmm. It's a hall of the famous, really. Sure. And uh, Tom Peters. Let's for an example, we just inducted Tom Peters this year. He's from Northern Maine, way up near the border of Canada. Mm -hmm. But Tom Peters was a hero to those guys up there. And. Uh, he never raced in any place but Maine. Hmm. Never went outside of the Maine borders. Yeah. And to those to those people in those small little towns in northern Maine, there was no bigger name than Tom Peters. Wow. And uh, he was actually inducted into the Maine Motorsports Hall of Fame. Uh, the only snowmobile racer to to be inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame. That's an honor. Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's a high uh, honor. But but you but I think they did that because he only raced in Maine. Yeah. So, did he have as big a record as Bruce Dunham? No. Did he have as big a record as Cal Reynolds or Bob Fortin? Right. No. But to those people in Northern Maine, Tom Peters was the biggest name in sports right there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the reason why Tom Peters is in the Hall of Fame. Nice. And I can pick out a few other people that may not have had perfect records, but they were they were big names here in the East. Mm -hmm. So uh, we try to give, uh, we try not, you know, not everybody can make it into the Hall of Fame. I realize that. Everybody yeah. should realize that. Sure. But if you know, if you did something special, if you, if your name was was one of the big names in the East, even though you might not have had a, a huge record, mm -hmm. you got a good shot. Yeah, good shot of being recognized. And, uh, yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, we've got Bruce Dunham in there. Bob Martin is in there. Uh, Conrad Rollins. Those are the first guys that we inducted. Mm -hmm. Uh, Calvin Reynolds from Maine is in there. Uh, there's quite a few Mainers. Uh, we've got, of course, Tom Peters. I just mentioned Tom. Sure. Paul Lamontang. Uh, Paul Lamontang. Yeah. Paul was a big, he was big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paul was a rough racer, and uh, and then later he raced Chaparral, and then he raced uh, Mercury. Uh, Paul, the, the name Paul Lamontang was huge here in New England. Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, well, Joe Wilkinson from Massachusetts. We just inducted Joe. Uh, Louis Lund, we inducted Louis in uh, 2018, I think, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Louis uh, only raced uh, maybe three, four years. Uh, I think he got number nine bib one year, mm -hmm. so he's top ten. Yeah. But what made Louis special? <clears throat> he may not have had his bigger record, maybe as Bob Fortin, but what made Louis special was he was the first person to drive an IFS sled. Oh, no kidding, yeah. Yeah, 
because he was racing for Harrington King in Randolph, Mass. in 1972. They were the Chaparral distributor. They flew Louie out to Colorado. Uh, Chaparral had a, a, a secret uh, race sled that they were working on out there. Yeah. And guess who he was working with? Huh. Bobby Unser. Oh, no kidding. Bobby Unser designed the first IFS suspension on a snowmobile, and Louie was, uh, was the uh, test driver for Bobby Unser. No kidding. So yeah, that's no Louis small. Won. He was the very first person to drive an IFS sled. And what sled today doesn't have an IFS suspension? Yeah, that's standard today. Yeah. So that 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 in itself. That's huge. Is a, is a, is a reason why Louis Louis Lund needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so uh, that's that's how we pick and choose uh, the folks that need to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Now, what, uh, what, or I should say, when and where is the next induction ceremony going to be? Uh, the next induction ceremony is going to be September 11th, <laughs> which in itself is, uh, uh, you know, not a very nice date to maybe have it, but uh, it's the it's the weekend after the fair. Okay. And uh, we'll I'll probably say something, you know, about September 11th. And, yeah, to kind of honor that uh, solemn, and, you know, solemn moment. Little, little something there. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it seems to be the best date for us because uh, we're inducting a, a person from New York who uh, is, is heavily into stock car racing and his grandson uh, races stock cars and he's on the pit crew. Yeah. And so... That happens to be the only open weekend for them. Gotcha. So, in order to have him be able to attend the induction, uh, that's that's the weekend we had to pick. Sure, sure. Yeah. And this is this is going to be at Crane's Museum in Lancaster. Yes, this will be at Crane's Museum, and uh, it'll we'll do another outside ceremony. That seemed to work really good. That was very nice. Hopefully, it doesn't rain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, if it does, we'll. Try to do it Sunday, probably. Yeah. Uh, as a rain day, but uh, hopefully, uh, usually the, by that time in the fall, we have really, really nice weather. Yeah. And I'd like to add too and, that uh, if anyone is planning to attend this from out of town, there's no other place to Lancaster stay. Lancaster Motel. The Lancaster yeah. Motel, absolutely. There are good yeah, friends absolutely. over there. Absolutely. The, they they they've stepped to the plate. They they are so all over this thing. Uh, the Lancaster Motel grew up with snowmobile racing. Uh, I believe that was built in 1956. Mm -hmm. It was built by Norman McLaughlin. Yeah. Uh, his daughter Sally married Mike Beatty, who is in the Hall of Fame at Riverside Speedway as a stock car racer. He was a well-known stock car racer here in New England back during the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. And Mike Beatty was a multi Grand Prix chairman, uh, so th there's a big, big history of the Lancaster Grand Prix tied to the snowmobile circuit racing. Yeah, and, and didn't they, they used uh, to have the award ceremony at the Lancaster Motel? That's where they, that's where they had the award ceremonies during the original Grand Prix. Yeah, and that's I think a lot of the racers stayed, stayed there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, can you just imagine, Mike, bellying up to the bar with Bob Eastman or <laughs> Larry Coltham? That would be amazing. Uh, you know, or one of the Trap Brothers, or I mean, they they were all here. That's where they stayed. That would be amazing. This place is huge. Yeah. Uh, not not in size, but in history. Yeah, the history is rich. Yeah, very rich with the Lancaster Motel. So. I think we probably will have to make that our official uh, site. I agree. Uh, for the for the Hall of Fame, the Lancaster Motel is the official place to stay. Yeah, for sure. There's no other. And uh, yeah, I and they fixed the rooms all up. The people that just purchased the motel uh, have done a tremendous job on the place. 
they've gone through every room. Uh, they put in all new Wi-Fi, new TVs, uh, refurbished every room. New so uh, everything. It, they, yeah. they brought it back up to to snuff, and uh, it's going to be uh, it's it's a great uh, asset. Yeah, to and the it's town just and to this hall. Of and it's just walking distance from the the ceremony. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's only a block away. Yeah, from Crane's Museum and the ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. Now let me ask yeah. you this. Um, each year that I attend this induction ceremony, the crowd gets bigger and bigger. So this is something that's growing, and the future is looking bright. What are you thinking yeah. are plans for the future for the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? What are you thinking about the future of this? Well, we're going to try to continue uh, adding more of the uh, original racing pioneers mm -hmm. uh, that raced, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, they're getting older all the time. They're they're in their late 70s, mid late 70s, early 80s, and we'd like to get them, you know, here while they're still with us. Yes, the clock is ticking. That, that being said, uh, when I uh, did Cal Reynolds uh, in 2018, we put uh, Cal on the wall, and he was huge back then. He was a skidoo racer, mm -hmm. and uh, he won about everything going. Yeah. And anyway, after the ceremony, uh, instead of going up for photos, instead of thinking about himself, Mike, I felt an arm across my shoulder, and it was Cal Reynolds whispering in my ear. Huh. He said, Midge, he said, Bob Fortin really needs to be up there. And I says, uh, I know, Mike. I, uh, I says, I, I know, Cal. Uh, you know what, though? What we're thinking about doing is getting all the people up there that are with us first, and, and then we'll try to do the ones that have passed away uh, at a later date. And he shook his head and he said, Midge, he said that Bob Eastman, that Bob Fort needs to be up there more sooner than later. Yeah. And uh, so I told Paul I, I, what what Cal said, and um, Paul said, "Yeah." He said, "What we probably should do is is uh, induct four people that are with us, and maybe one who's passed away each year." Yeah. Because you know what? Their families aren't getting any younger either. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Good and point. And so, in, 20, in 2019, we had Bob Fortin's two sons, Michael and David, uh, attend. And uh, I asked Cal, I, I emailed Cal, and I said, Calvin, uh, would you please say a few good words? about Bob Fortin because you raced against him you, you know he raced for Timberland machines and uh, he knew Bob very well he said certainly he said I'd, I'd love to do that so I introduced Cal when we did Bob and his two sons stood up there it was quite moving I and, remember that uh, it was very touching yeah so yeah Calvin did that for us and we uh, we thanked him, and I, I know he's a busy man. You know, Cal's got several businesses over in Maine there that he that he has to attend. And so I I, I said to him, I said uh, well, when he said, uh, uh, yeah, he said I would do Bob Fortin for you guys and and, and say a few good words about him. Yeah. And I said. Uh, well, I'm I'm just pleased that you could do this just just one more time for us, Cal. I know you're busy. He said, Midge, let me tell you something. He said, as long as me and my wife Mary Ann are able, we will be attending every single Hall of Fame induction that you're going to hold here from now on. Nice, and he's true to his word. I've so seen that, him at every one. Yeah, yeah, and he spoke this year at. Uh, Ted Why Not? Ted Why Not, of course, was uh, the flagman for those guys for yes. years and years. He was also a Yamaha representative, and 
pal Soul Jamaha over there in Maine. So, yeah. you know, Ted was over there a lot, and uh, he was a good, good friend of Cal's. And, uh, so Cal spoke a, a few nice words about Teddy this that year. That was nice, too, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, very nice. So any final words, Mitch, uh, before we close this interview? Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to add yeah, about the uh, Hall of Fame? Well, uh, I just want to tell you folks uh, how much we appreciate Mike LaPierre here that's interviewing me. Uh, Mike has gone overboard for us, and I just have to put that in. I appreciate that. Uh, we really we really appreciate everything you do, Mike. Well, you're very and, welcome. Uh, as far as this Hall of Fame, we hope to continue this down the road. And we hope to get uh, as many of our original pioneer racers who, who, who were big names back then on the wall at Paul Crane's Museum. And uh, that's, that's basically where we're at. And uh, these inductions are free. Uh, anybody can attend. Uh, bring a lawn chair and... And join us. If uh, if you are my age, I'm going to be 70 in March. If if anybody out there remembers those events the way I did, and stood out in the cold for three hours or four hours watching those guys race, if you can remember the exciting time that, that was, then this is for you. Yeah. Because reliving you the get golden to hear age. these guys on you get to shake their hand you get to you get to talk to them and you get to see these guys be recognized that uh, that you know it was just an event that will never come back again we'll never ever see anything that exciting again and uh, if you want to relive those moments just one more time please join us and the next event is September 11th 2021 at Paul Crane Snowmobile Museum in Lancaster. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that to what you just said. Right now is the golden age of, of celebrating the golden age of snowmobiling. Exactly. It exactly. truly is. And uh, yeah, I'd like yeah. to invite everyone who's within driving distance to, to come on, come on by and, yeah. and uh, enjoy it with us. It grows, stay it gets bigger every year. It's a it's a wonderful thing. Yes, yeah, stay at the Lancaster Motel. Yeah. Yeah, and and then come by to the after party at the Lancaster Motel as well. That's it's a yeah, wonderful yeah, time. Yeah, they have an after party at the motel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, back years ago during the Grand Prix, I told these guys, I said, you race uh, handlebar to handlebar all day long, and stand elbow to elbow at the bars all night. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was. They used to they used to pull the edges off because, <clears throat> you know, these these guys. <laughs> These guys are crazy. They used to pull the engines off their slads and take them inside the motel room and rebuild them <laughs> for the next day's race. Nice. And that's yeah, one of the, that's yeah. one of the remarkable things too about racing is they can be so um, ruthlessly competitive out on the track, but after the race is yeah. over, they party together and they have a good time and they laugh about it. Yeah. It's it's an, it's incredibly yeah. ironic, but it's 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 a wonderful thing about racing is that. That the relationships yeah, yeah, are more really. important than, than anything. It's it's a wonderful yeah, you thing. Know, they they made lifelong friends, Mike. Yeah. You know these these guys uh, when you, you when you, their eyes light up the minute they see an old competitor. Yeah. Uh, you know that they haven't seen for forty years. You know. Yeah, and to watch them reminisce, uh, it's a truly special thing. They, yeah, they they're in, they're they're in heaven when they're doing it. They love it. Go ahead, it's I'm sorry. It's more like a family reunion. It is. Yeah. And to hear all those old stories, because they can recall like a specific moment on some turn in the track during a race where things were happening and, and, and kind of relive yeah. that, and it's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Or, or a laugh because, you know, about uh, an incident that uh, some guy pushed them off the track yeah. when they were in the lead, you know, and... Uh, and, you know, they say, oh, you push me off the track, you push me over the bank or something like that, and yeah. then they laugh about it. They yeah. probably weren't laughing at the time, but... No. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is only going to be a small window here, too. 
It's true. The clock because is ticking for all of us. Like I just said, they're 75, 80 years old, 85 years old, and they're not going to be around forever. Yeah. Yeah, the clock is ticking so on all of this. We've got a small window here to enjoy these guys. Yeah, to really do to, something with this. to uh, appreciate these guys. Yeah. And women. Yes. Yeah, there are some uh, truly so remarkable women in this, this racing as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. Judy Rinaldi. Yes. Ten World Series. That's incredible. She won ten World Series. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, not not no man no man has ever done that before. So, uh, you know, she's uh, I mean, there's there's nobody <laughs> nobody close. No. Uh, unbelievable. And, and uh, the nice thing about her too is to think about someone so accomplished, but to 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 visit with her, she's just the easiest person to talk to and. The most relatable, personable person, uh, very oh, yeah. down to earth, just a classy, classy lady. It's uh, and, oh, yeah. and I could say they're the right. same with the rest of them as well. You know, for all of yeah. their accomplishments, they're, they're very that? down to earth. Yeah, those are the nicest people. It's true. Yeah, they're no really egos, just guess. very they're approachable. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. They all are. It's true. Yeah, no, uh, Paula Montang. I mean. Uh, who, who wouldn't want to party with Paul Lamont? Yes, he is the best he guy to hang out with. He's a lucky guy. Yeah, he's a lot of fun to visit with. He, he's a lot of fun. He really yeah. is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good. Well, I appreciate your time with us, uh, uh, Mitch, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll close it out, but uh, I really appreciate your time, and, and we'll have more interviews on this topic, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All righty. I've got more tales to tell. Well, good. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for my, thanks for this. Today Mike. on VintageSnowmobileLovers.com, we're in Lancaster, New Hampshire, at Crane's Snowmobile Museum, and our good friends Mitch, Midge Rosebrook, and Paul Crane are just about to give us a tour of the museum. How you doing, guys? Good, good. Good. Before we get started, Paul is the first person in the U.S. ever to ride a snowmobile. Do I understand that correctly? A, mo a skidoo. A skidoo, okay. A skidoo only. I skidoo. wasn't the first to ride a snow machine. I was the first one to ride a skidoo. Nice. American. and First American to ride a skidoo. Nice. In Canada and here. Excellent. Not many people can lay claim to that. I don't believe so. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> awesome. start down this this row here all right uh, everybody can understand what the uh, just by looking at them what they are so we'll go down this row here first and then we'll On the end wall here, we have some some of the clothing. Most of them are practically mine in the family that wore that road things. Nice. So these are yours from back in the day, you lot, and your family. A lot of them are. <coughs> I would say that eighty percent of them are. Nice. And at the end here is a Scatmobile, which is rare. It's got three real big bloom tires. It's made, it was made out in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I met the guy years ago, and he was driving a Stanley Steamer up his driveway, and I told him I just picked one of those up, and I'm going to start a museum someday, and he said, I'm going to give you something, young man, something that nobody has, my first sign that was put on the factory. And it's a plywood sign. It's a little rough, but 
I was going to cut the bottom part off where it was rotten, but I just figured it would lose the value of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Wow, that is awesome. That's quite a gift to receive. Yeah. Outstanding. Cool. Then I got patches on the back wall. Oh, yes, yeah. Patches on the back wall. Yeah. And Let's see if I can get in a little closer on that And up on the rack over here, we got some of the small snow machines. I remember the kitty cat from back in the day. Yeah. Then we got the 1926 Model T snowmobile, which is a foot narrower than the average snowmobile. And if you look at the running board, it says snowmobile right on it. Really? Which is rare. Right here on the step. Wow. And what year was this, Paul? You said 1920-something? 1920 1926 as the plate. Oh, yes, yeah. Wow. I usually give rides when the snow's deep. I haven't done it this year yet, but I will be. Nice. And then some more mini sleds up top. Mini sleds on the top. Many snows plus a couple old sleighs. Nice, and then these are some of the early mass produced ski doos. This is a 61 ski doo with the wooden skis. This is a 61 ski doo with the replaceable steel skis because the wooden ones we'd go out in the field and we'd break them. Huh. Wow. Now that first sled that you rode, was it s similar to this one? or Just like that. Just like this one? Yeah. Wow. But it was a 1960. 1960, okay. Yeah, I have one, but I haven't got it over here yet. Okay. Really? Yeah. Wow. That one has got 200 and something miles on it. Unreal. That's a nice shape. And I think they stopped making those in what, 2005 or something? They stopped. The Elite? 2004 and 5, I think they made a silver one. Yeah. yeah. A much more modern looking one. Yeah. Was that the last year, do you know? Yeah, it was. It was, okay. I like that TNT. The old silver. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, I see a, a shift lever on that. Did that have reverse? Yes, reverse. Yeah. Nice. And did it have like a low gear for? No, it's yeah, just the regular. Just a reverse? Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's mint. It's only got 200 and something miles on it. Nice. A buddy of mine growing up had a silver bullet like that. Then we have the 64 tin cab motor ski. Wow. Which they didn't make very many of them. Then a 65 motor ski. Then the racing motor ski, which is a 64 Hurricane. Yeah. And then this here was a 500 racing sled that apparently, so I've been told, the factory had it, yeah. Motor ski factory had it. Wow. That's cool. And then a Zephyr, which is all original. Wow, 1970, yeah. I remember 
remember these Nuvix back in the day. My father's friend had one just like that. Then a pink motor skate was made from a friend of mine for his daughter. Wow. That is cool. You don't see those every day. No. It's got some ski spreaders on there too. Yeah. Keep it stable. His daughter wanted it pink. Nice. This here is a rare 340 motor skate bullet. Oh. And the 340 Sonic, Super Sonic, Sonic Pro, Pro Sled. Then the racing Northway. They may, only made 21 of them. 21, Sonic wow. Sleds, yeah. That's a real big hood. Does that mean there's a real big engine underneath? Or? 440. 440, yeah. yeah. Nice, nice racing cat. Then a 76 Sunno Pro. Nice. Yeah. That's one of the cooler looking sleds ever to be on the snow, I think. And then the Husky. Yes, yeah. Of course, the RV. It's the new RV that they raced in 75. Nice, those were awesome. Then the Snow Cruiser, which was a repeat of 500, which, as far as I know, there's only four of those in existence. Four of those, wow. That's amazing. There's one in uh, the Brunswick, I understand. I've seen that one. And I understand there's one up in Peterborough where they came from. And I don't know if the one's still in New Jersey or not, but there was one down there. Nice. We had one like this when I was a kid. It was a consumer model, though, not the Starfire. That was fast. Even the consumer model, the 250, was really fast. Hello, everyone. This is Rob and Mike. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm doing good. Mike, yourself? Very well. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Now, uh, today, we're going to be talking about AMSOIL. And uh, in a few moments, we're going to show you how you can get the deepest discounts, free shipping, and free gifts when you order your AMSOIL products through us. But first, I'm going to ask Rob to give you a quick description of what AMSOIL is and why you should consider using AMSOIL products in your motorized vehicles. Thanks, Mike. AMSOIL is 100% synthetic oil. Everybody uses AMSOIL for a different reason. Some people like the benefits that AMSOIL is warrantied for 25,000 miles or one year. The reason we can do that is because AMSOIL doesn't oxidize. It doesn't form the usual carbons, gums, sludges like petroleum oils do. That's why we can keep it in the engines longer. Petroleum oils never do wear out. They oxidize themselves. That's why they have to be changed at 3,000 kilometers. And AMSOIL likes the benefit that you only have to change the oil once a year. That saves some money. Some of the people like the benefit of AMSOIL is it's a slipperier type lube. By having a slipperier type lube, it cuts down friction drag. By less friction and drag, engines run 20 to 50 degrees cooler, better gas mileage. Now, AMSOIL says 25% more protection than the industry requires is in the AMSOIL bottles. My average customer gets about 10% increase in gas mileage. That's a big savings. Yeah. And by cutting down friction and drag, for every 10 degrees you cut down a friction and drag, doubles the life of the engine. So by having the engine run cooler, it makes it last longer. Some people like the benefit of the range of the AMSOIL. AMSOIL's flash point is 425 degrees, and it pours at 50 below zero. Wow. If you ever try petroleum oil when it's 10 below, it turns to the honey. And yeah. in the summertime, petroleum oil thins out, and once, once it thins out, that's when it starts breaking down. So AMSOIL's an all-season oil, can give you better gas mileage, longer engine life, less maintenance. It ends up being cheaper over a year's time running AMSOIL than it is petroleum oils. That's amazing, that's amazing. And AMSOIL is, is available for pretty much any motorized vehicle, uh, any from, anything from lawn equipment, cars, trucks, boats, ATVs, motorcycles, snowmobiles. Yep, yep. And a lot of people phone me up and say, well, what's the benefit of our gear loop? 
exactly what I told you about the engine oil. It pours in cold weather, it runs cooler, makes the equipment last longer. And they say, well, it's the benefit of the small engine. Same thing, makes the engine run cooler, last longer, better performance. So it saves on all the applications that AMSO has available. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah, let's uh, let's talk now. Uh, hopefully this has convinced people uh, to think about maybe joining us in the AMSOIL experience. Let's talk about some of the discounts and free shipping and how that all happens. I'm going to pop a, a graphic on the screen. And uh, yeah, by all means, if you want to talk talk people through how this preferred customer program works. AMSOIL has a number of different programs. One of our main ones is a catalog customer where somebody can order directly out of our catalog. If they order out of the catalog, they order $100 worth, AMSOIL will ship it right to their house. But our best program is our preferred customer. For only $10 for six months, you become a preferred customer, you save 25% on all the product. You order $100 worth, they're going to give you free shipping. Um, you don't have to order a whole case. You can mix and match. Say you want four bottles of small engine, seven bottles of 5W30, and a couple of gear loops. You can mix and match. You can order one bottle at a time if you want. There's no minimums, no maximums. By being a preferred customer, you save over 25% on all the products you're going to buy. Amsoil sends you extra gifts, uh, a $5 gift certificate on your birthday, $5 when you renew, renew your account and stuff like that. So it's a good way to save on some of the products you want to buy. For sure, for sure. Yeah, it's an incredible value. And this is the, the deepest level of discount that anyone can get when ordering Amsoil. Is that correct? It is. It is. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's take people through the the step-by-step -step experience of, of placing an Amsoil order. Then that would include signing up for the preferred customer discount, or sorry, preferred customer program so they can receive those deepest levels of discount. So let's go to the website. This is what the website's going to look at look like. These are some screenshots. If you once you go to Amsoil.com, there's a link in the description, or you can just type that into a browser, Amsoil.com. This is the page you land on at the upper corner of the page there, you see how I've circled in red. That is the link to click the join now link that will take you to the preferred customer program page where you can take advantage of all these discounts and free shipping and everything that we've just been talking about. This is what that page looks like. In the lower right, you're going to click join now. This will pop up. You select the duration you'd like, whether it's six months or 12 months and click add to cart. Now, once this, this uh, pop up goes away, you'll be back on the main page and the upper left, you'll see where I've got that red arrow. It says shop. Now you can start shopping for products and on your very first order, you're going to get these discounts and the free shipping as long as it's over hundred dollars. You'll get all of these benefits right away. So once you click shop, it's going to take you to uh, some product, the product page. There's different types of oils, lubricants, so on and so forth. For the benefit of this exercise we're doing now, I'm just going to click motor oil. It shows different types of motor oil. Let's click gasoline. Now this takes us to an item. It's uh, their synthetic motor oil. And you can see the item there and there's choices for different viscosities, but take a look at the price. Let's take a closer look, let's zoom in. Uh, but if you've joined the preferred customer program first, you're going to automatically get the deepest levels of discount. That's what we're looking at here. You're saving $3.80 on that quart of oil. Instead of paying $16.29, you're now paying, paying $12.49 for that quart of oil. That is the deepest level of discount you can possibly get. And then uh, you just add the, the, the quantity that you'd like. You select any other items that you're thinking about, add them to the cart. And once you uh, click add to cart for the final time, you're going to see this come up at the top of the screen. It's going to show your items and your, your um, the total that you're at so far. <coughs> Pardon me. And then uh, you just click view cart in the upper right, and that'll take you to your cart. Uh, take a close look here at the upper right. That blue box shows that you're getting free shipping. You're eligible for free shipping on this order because it's over $100. That little yellow box shows that you've got the preferred customer membership on your order that gives you the deepest levels of discounts for the next six to 12 months. And then below that, you've got the, the items that have been selected. I just, for the exercise here, I selected nine quarts of the signature series, but that brings us up over hundred dollars for the free shipping. We're saving $34.20. $34 and if you're ready to, to finish, you click checkout now, and that takes you uh, to this screen here. If you haven't signed up with an Amsoil account at this point, just click in the lower right to create an account, create a new account. It's going to ask you for some basic information, uh, name and those types of things. Now let's take a closer look. You'll see this gray shaded box. This is a very important box. This is going to ask you if someone has referred you to Amsoil. And if so, please enter my name. My name is Mike Lapierre. It's spelled right there on the screen for the correct spelling. And also the referral number, 304-55594. That's how um, you make sure that Rob and I get credit for this. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have signed up for Amsoil under Rob. So when you order using this referral number, Rob and I both benefit. So if you enjoy these podcasts that we're doing, this is a wonderful way to support the podcast because when you order uh, using this referral number, Rob and I both benefit. And the commissions I make go directly toward offsetting the cost of doing this pod these podcasts. So I thank you in advance for that, for using my referral number. I very much appreciate it. Uh, and once you've done that, you just go into the next screen to enter your payment information and you're done. 
Now, once you've entered, once you've placed your order that's over $100, uh, and that, that order includes your Amsoil Preferred Customer Program, you are now eligible to get a free DVD from myself. Now, this is going to be either a muscle car DVD or a vintage snowmobile DVD. Uh, use the email address on the screen, WKSPodcasts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Let me know which email. I'm sorry. Let me know which DVD you would like me to send you, the muscle car or the uh, uh, vintage snowmobile DVD, and I'll get that right out to you. As you're typing in that that email in the subject line, be sure and type in capital letters, free DVD requests, so it stands out as I'm checking my email, and we'll get that right out to you. So I guess the last thing, Rob, that we wanted to talk about is uh, if someone is considering Amsoil as a business opportunity. Um, yeah. Yes. If anybody has a retail or a commercial account and they would like to buy directly from Amsoil, just send Mike a line. He'll show you how to set up and you can buy directly from Amsoil. But if you are interested in starting your own part-time business, a part-time business that can grow into a full-time income, Mike and I will show you the Amsoil marketing plan. Amsoil has a large selection of products to cover almost every application. So it doesn't matter if you're in the snowmobile, boating, or ATV in, or, or hot rods. We have an oil for every application. It's a fun type business that I really enjoy doing. Where else can I go and have fun and make money doing it? And Mike and I are here to help you all the way along if you need any help on how to promote or, or to find new accounts. We're here to help you. For sure, for sure. So when you sign up under that, uh, that number, this 304-555-94, you're getting Rob and I as a team. Now, Rob has been doing Amzo for 40 years. Can you believe that? 40 years. So he knows every aspect of this business and he knows all of the ins and outs of the products. So he'll be able to help you with any kind of product questions or any kind of questions to show you the different business models that you can do with Amsoil. And then the other thing that you get when you sign up under me is I've got a strong background in social media. So if you need some coaching on how to generate Amsoil leads using Facebook and YouTube, I'm happy to coach you with that when you sign up under Rob and I. Uh, you get both of us as a team uh, to help you, to coach you, to support you, whatever you need to get you, get you off and running with this business and having fun with it. It's like Rob said, it's enorm an enormous amount of fun. If you're like Rob and I and you enjoy going to any kind of you know boat shows, car shows, motorcycle shows, snowmobile shows, anything with a motor, you like going to those shows, those events, those races, this is a great way to turn that into a, 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 a income opportunity for you. Yes, yes. And just by wearing my AMSO hat at one of these events, people come up and ask me about AMSO. People, people don't know where to buy it, and I'm there to help them, show them where they can buy the products. Perfect, perfect. Well, cool, cool. Well, this is great. Uh, any final thoughts, Rob, before we wrap it up? AMSO is a fun business. AMSO has been around since 1968. You know, it was the first synthetic oil to be AI approved. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's very early in the game, too, isn't it? Yes. For sure. Well, good. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for viewing. Hopefully, we've gotten you excited, as excited as we are about the Amsoil products. We'd love it if you could enjoy, if you could join us either uh, as someone who uses the Amsoil products or to join the Amsoil team uh, as a business opportunity. And we thank you so much for viewing. Have a okay. great day. You have a good day.